the organizers, Global Entrepreneurship Network, and our hosts in Uganda, Enterprise Uganda and the rest. Thank you, Coinworth, for representing. My name is Matenga Shoni, the founding director and CEO of Coinworth Uganda. The global statistics show us that only 16% of the adult population in Uganda is saving in a formal banking or deposit taking institution. Uh, the de Deputy Governor of Uganda, Dr. Louis Kasekende, says that regardless of what you do for a living or how much you earn, saving is still an issue that we all struggle with. The question is why? That several banks and MFIs, circles and village saving groups that have been formed to help Ugandans get into the habit of saving. But how come we are still troubled or grappling with only 16% of Ugandans saving? with 85% of Uganda in the informal sector. Women and men doing businesses by the roadside, in farming, in poultry, in the stone quarries. The question is, when they wake up to go and earn, how much do They in how much can they bring to the bank? What avenues have been Seems to have lost coin worth. We seem to have lost coin worth due to first. Okay, we're live. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to be before you this morning. My name is Andrew Dembe and I am the founder and CEO of Moby Clinic. And uh, at Moby Clinic, we are addressing a problem. 77% of 42 million Ugandans live in rural areas or call them last mile villages and peri-urban areas of Uganda. About 20 million people of these have to walk over 12 kilometers to the nearest health center, which takes two hours on average and the most affected are the pregnant women. Uh, because of the difficulty in accessing healthcare, so many people have resorted to the local and traditional health systems, which is severely harmful. As a result, we have 25 women dying every day in Uganda while giving birth. And many of these statistics are coming from these last mile areas. We have over 7,000 people who also die annually due to consequences of difficulty in difficulty in accessing healthcare services in these last mile villages. Now, it is very important to note that 75% uh, of doctors in Uganda prefer to practice in urban areas where only 20% of the population lives. In urban areas, the doctor to patient ratio is one to 8,300. But in the rural areas, the story is different. It is one doctor for every 22,000 persons. So our vision as Moby Clinic is to revolutionize and ease access to healthcare, especially maternal health services in the rural and peri-urban areas of Uganda and East Africa. We did our research before we rolled out our solution 
And we saw that we could not solve this problem only digitally. So we had to come up with a fusion of physical and digital interventions. And the first part of our solution is expanding and enabling community workforce capacity. The other part is creating a digital safety net to ensure that the quality of services is, is uh, of standard that these community health promoters are giving in the communities. Then also our application offers integrated an integrated referral system. In the future, we want to have our application being multidimensional and all these functions aimed at, in, at easing healthcare access. Just like you see the illustration there, this illustration is for rural areas. We have a pregnant woman who instead of walking many kilometers, first goes to the community health provider. And this community health provider, once challenged uh, by any issue, can consult or using our application and uh, can consult a doctor who is in the city. So our application offers a digital interface, a digital safety net, and uh, the community health worker can consult from senior medics. Yeah. So what is new about our service? One, we're providing a digital safety net, and this is a new concept of its kind world over. Um, we are also offering affordable home-based healthcare in communities. Then our mode of operation is about collaboration, not competition. Then we also improve the doctor to patient ratio. Let me show you our potential. We can be the preferred choice for the abandoned rural market, which has about 30 million Ugandans. Our digital solutions can revolutionize healthcare access world over. We can actually be the Uber or Airbnb of the health industry. We play more, we want to play more in the connecting, in the connecting role. Our value proposition to the community health providers who are known as CHPs, we put the skill, the skill in their hands to save lives, lives of mothers, of babies, and other patients. To the doctors, we enable the doctors to reach more patients in the comfort of their office. To pregnant women, we give you help from the time you find out that you are pregnant till you when your baby is a year old. This way, we are combating maternal deaths and uh, infant mortality. Then to other patients, we collaborate with health centers to enable giving you healthcare at your desktop. Let's look at our customer acquisition. We want to get customers through direct face-to-face -face acquisition, liaising also with local leaders and uh, local governments. Then flyers, brand ambassadors, we so far have about two brand ambassadors, ETC. And our future growth model is on granting franchise. Our business financial model is transaction-based and this, our community health promoters or providers know that the more transactions, the more commission or pay for them. We also allow subscription model, for example, for the pregnant women for their nine month period. Our team is a multi-talented team and it's of a diverse professional background. Myself, I'm a social justice activist, entrepreneur, a paralegal and a writer. Uh, my co-founder is an accountant. And then uh, we also have Mrs. Mary Senyonga, who is a community health uh, provider who has, who has been in this field for about 30 years. We also have Dr. Balaba Martin as a project advisor and head of innovations at Infectious Disease Institute. We also have Dr. Ian Clark, who serves as our project advisor. We have Dr. Mirembe Joel, who's the head of medics and the rest of the team. So here I share our journey and traction. In September, 2018 to 2019, we did research, which was, uh, made by us and the team of Belgian volunteer students from the university in Belgium. Then in March, 2019, our ideation process was supported by UNDP Kenya. And in March, 2020, in March, 2019, again, we were selected as the best healthcare access idea globally by Novartis International, beating over 500 ideas then. In April, 2019, we made consultations and in October, 2019, we rolled out. So far, we have impacted about 4,000 people in the community in Buyikwe, where we operate. Uh, a thousand of these have benefited from our services directly, and 3,000 have benefited off our brand promotion activities and uh, social corporate responsibility. So our financial plan 
when we break it down in one sentence, it is $10 to improve access for one individual in rural areas. Uh, we have also, now when we, if, by, if we are lucky to win, we will uh, use $10,000 to train and deploy community health providers. We have also an allocation for CHP curriculum and we have Clark University that also partners with us and can help in this. We want to buy Android tablets for our community health providers. And uh, the breakdown is listed. The rest is administrative. Now, why invest in Mobi Clinic? First of all, we have an invest, build, recruit, seller, and selling out. You invest with us, we build with what with your money, and then we recruit the, the community health providers. They go in the communities, provide services, make sales, make profits, and then you can get out your profits. And then secondly, we ease access to maternal health services, thus saving lives. And then another, our model is easy to replicate elsewhere. We are cognizant of the fact that we are addressing a pressing global need. Our solution here in Uganda is also needed elsewhere because so many people live in such last mile areas all over the world, and it's the same issue. And our extra health workforce that we create in rural areas can help in health emergencies such as COVID, for example, in contact tracing, and also our potential impact is very big. And in five years, we can directly impact over 3 million people in East Africa, half of these coming from Uganda. And in 10 years, we can impact over 10 million people. But we have been in operation for the past uh, close to 12 months and we are not just seated. We have already impacted over a thousand people and there is a YouTube video link that has been attached. Lastly, as I finish, I want uh, to invite you to, to think about this. Today, the world is on standstill, all because of health. We need to reimagine, rethink our global health systems and health access for all. We need to prepare and build for now and the future. Never before had the world shut down and countries closed doors to each other. This is testament that before we think and invest in everything else, we ought to think health first. Otherwise, we risk being ill-prepared for future pandemics Decentralization and democratization of access to health services is the first step we have to take. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andrew Dembe, CEO of Mobi Clinic, Uganda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, please share your video. Judges, any questions? Uh, Leo? Yes, I have, a, I have a question around the finances. Um, so thank you, Andrew. Um, first, my first question is, have you generated any income over the past year with the thousand uh, people impacted? And secondly, um, on the business model, so I'm curious a bit more about how this works. Um, how much um, does a health care provider um, health worker pay for the subscription to the platform um, or how much does a um, an end user pay uh, to be treated by one of your health workers um, okay uh, going for the could for I the could I add to that before you respond all right um, this is Kevin yes so I basically have uh, uh, two additional questions. One in relation to who actually pays, because I think I, I didn't get that clearly, who actually pays for the service? Is it, uh, is it the health worker? Is it the, 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 the patient who pays? And when you say the $10, $10 for one individual, that is for how long? For how much of a period does someone actually pay for the ten dollars? And then I would want to know that is really in relation to uh, Leo's question. And then an extra question is, how are you? How are, how are the village uh, health workers linked to the village health visitors that the that the the Minister of Health is using? And how are you separating yourself from that? So then I'll have other questions a little bit later on. All right. Uh, I think let me first go for these questions. 
uh, first of all, how much we have collected so far, how much we have made. We have uh, so far raised 50,000 US dollars of support from uh, Sandos International and Novartis. Of no, can, I, can I just, so, yeah. I'm not asking about, I'm not asking about money raised, I'm asking about money earned from, from your business model. All right. Uh, from the business model, so far we have uh, made about uh, 8,000 US dollars because we, we are operating as a social enterprise. We strike a balance between the profitability and the creation of impact. And uh, from the onset, uh, we are trying to be in between these two. And uh, the beginning is much more uh, dwelling on the impact as uh, we polish the, the, the business mo model. Yeah, but uh, this is how it operates. The money, uh, someone, uh, the, one of the judges asked about who pays. We actually ask uh, payment from the end receiver, from the patients in the communities. That's why it's transaction-based model. So they pay, well, and obviously we, 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 our pricing is, is put in light of these communities. We know the economic trends in these communities, and so we ask what they can afford. And also we have a subscription oh, sorry, model sorry where- to, to interrupt. Eh? So if it is the, 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 the patient who actually pays, my question is how yeah. much? How much do they pay and for how long? Okay. Um, why we called it transaction, it's because uh, for a, given the service, the, the different services have different pricing. So for instance, if it's a pregnant woman and she, uh, she prefers subscription, she can go for it. If she maybe has malaria and she, uh, the community health provider has treated the malaria and it's ending in about uh, 7,000 shillings or 8,000 shillings, that also is, is what they pay. Um, I hope I'm clear on this. Yes, you are. Just generated more questions. So, but first answer what we have asked and then we can we can go back to those other questions that have come up. Oh, all right. And uh, so for the business model, like I've said, we have the transaction based one where someone pays for the particular service they have, uh, they have gotten at, the moment, at that specific moment. And then another is subscription for those who can afford. Uh, they, they pay subscription, the pregnant mother saying I'm paying for, for nine months and there they can pay about close to 180,000 for international services. And uh, yeah, and so you, I think I've answered who pays and the business model and how much have we raised and the $10 for one person. We, are, we, are, we have broken down this, the $10 to increase access for one single person, uh, basing on how much do we as a venture need to, to run for a year, because we think we are, we are increasing access to individuals. So the statement of $10 to increase access for one individual is one that cuts across on, on, on a 12 month basis. Yeah, I've, uh, we, we, how much do we need to run for year? And uh, how much does it take us to increase access to keep these people, uh, the community health providers in the communities? And that's why when you, the unit statement is $10 to increase uh, access for one person. So for example, for instance, we believe that if we got $500,000 divide by, divide by uh, and, 10, that would Andrew, us. Andrew, before you go to that, Please answer our questions because yeah. uh, there seem to be questions about your business model. Uh, how much, how do you recruit people? Okay. How do you recruit the community health workers? Do you pay okay. them? And of the okay. people you treated in the last year, how much did each of them pay? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, then also, we. Coming back to the issue of model, sometimes we have humanitarian organizations purchasing services on behalf of communities. For instance, in the in, in COVID here, we had uh, the African Leadership Academy buying, paying for services of the month of June for the communities. So all we had to do is to make sure they're giving services 
and uh, taking account of these services and uh, building African Leadership Academy. So for the very vulnerable communities, we also appeal to humanitarian organizations to purchase uh, services and enable uh, the, 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 the healthcare services down in the communities. About recruiting, we, we go in the communities, introduce ourselves, and uh, we can get members of the community who are, who are willing to be community health providers. Um, okay, members of the communities who are willing to be community health providers, these are trained and deployed in the very communities they live in. Then also when we come in a community and realize that it already has certain community nurses, we simply liaise with those who are existing, yeah, and, and give them our gadgets, our device, our Android tablet, and uh, yeah, because this tablet, at the end of the day, the community health provider pays for it. This, these are their equipment, pays for it, but over a given period of time, which we can agree with them. And uh, about uh, how they get paid, we do not want to take the responsibility of salaries. So we do commission basis. All these people are paid according to the volume, to the bulk of services they have given out in the communities. And so the more you work, the more you avail yourself because for every transaction, they have to record it on the application, over the application. And that this is what helps us to keep track of who, of what bulk has a particular individual done. And on average, a community health provider earns 200,000 to 300,000 from our services. Yeah, uh, that's it for now. I've seen other questions in the chat. Let me try to respond to some of them. I think you have responded to most of them. Do patients pay uh, Somebody, you? Somebody is asking, does Moby Clinic own the intellectual property around the app that they use to connect to the city doctors? Of going to the issue of IP, we are still pursuing the legalities cons, uh, as regards IP because uh, we have faced an issue of IP before where we had, uh, when we participated in a global competition and someone somewhere else was replicating the same idea, but we managed to harmonize this and uh, we are following the, the, we are pursuing the legalities concerning IP. Uh, the $8,000 I mentioned comes from individuals, 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 uh, that's not because that individuals, not the organizations. Okay. Could I ask one more question? Uh, I think, uh, one could of the questions I have is, question? okay. When you say the transaction uh, fees that is paid, do you already have a system of collection? How do you actually get then that reimbursement since the health workers are actually not your, uh, not your employees? They are rather like contractors. So they're not actually contractors per se. So how do, how do you actually recover? How do you get reimbursed if you say they are taking say 4,000 shillings and you're taking 4,000 shillings, how do you get recover that money? Okay, we, we have structures. The community health providers have a head of uh, community health provide, providers in the communities. And uh, we also have our accounting team, but we at the moment still rely at, at the mercy of the community health providers because when they, do for whichever transaction they have done, they reflect it in, uh, on, the, on the application, what service they have given and how much it costed. So this, they take note of, of how much they were paid. And so this enables our accounting team that gets down to the field to account. And either way, we can still, the, the accounting always gives us the answers. We can still check on the inventory, uh, what drugs were they given and how much has it moved yeah, so the systems of accounting also enable us to really see whether we are making, uh, whether we are progressing or not. Yeah, I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, let's go on to the next person. 
that will be Ezra from Tree Resources Enterprises. Um, Andrew, you can turn off your video. Ezra, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Do you want to share your slides or I share them for you? I don't know. Let me first try and see if it can come. Can it be seen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, I think I can move on. Yes, please. Okay, good morning, everyone. And I'm so grateful uh, to be part of this competition <laughs> today uh, to represent Uganda to the Entrepreneurship World Cup. Uh, I'm Ezra. Uh, I'm Ezra uh, Masolaki, uh, co-founder and the CEO, Tree please Resource Enterprises. Ezra, please go into full screen. Sorry? Put your presentation in full screen. Just continue. Just continue. Okay, I don't know. Is it, is it possible that uh, because it is okay? Is that okay? Yes, that is fine. Please continue. Okay. Yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. So, I'm Ezra, uh, co founder, the CEO, Tree Resource Enterprises, based in uh, Bali. Uh, we are planting trees uh, to protect trees and livelihoods. We have a vision uh, of seeing a world where millions of farmers can protect and earn planting high value agroforestry trees. Over 20 million Ugandans are farmers but the occupation is at stake due to poor farming practices leading to tree cover and soil fertility loss. Uh, we are working with these farmers to make sure that we can be able to reverse uh, the trend and we can be able to offer a solution where uh, these millions of farmers can be able to engage in sustainable farming practices through agroforestry farming. Uh, we are looking at promoting agroforestry practices for forestry and soil restoration through provision of tree uh, uh, seeds, seedlings, and also offering uh, trainings to the farmers. And in doing this, uh, we work uh, with the farmers in the, giving them trainings and uh, also making sure that these farmers can have uh, built up as a farming system that can be resilient to the climate shocks of heavy rainfalls, but also uh, 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 where the drought, uh, considering the fact that trees uh, are able to offer uh, resilience, especially during hot periods, they offer shade to the plants, uh, but also they are able to restore the soil fertility and at the same time diversifying the income of the rural uh, farmers. Our approach, we provide farmers with agroforestry tree species that can build up their resilience, as I've shared before. And in the photo, uh, those are some of our uh, 
clients that we are, are working with, uh, doing agroforestry, growing trees together with the crops. Uh, our target market, uh, we work with farmers, NGOs and the government institutions. These farmers are able to buy uh, the products, uh, mainly the tree seedlings, but also we work with NGOs which buy uh, the products from us, which buy uh, tree seedlings, uh, which also buy uh, seeds, uh, going to establish nurseries, and also government institutions like special local government, and in our business model, uh, these farmers are able to pay uh, for the seedlings that they do uh, take. Energy also, uh, energy was are able to offer uh, these seedlings to farmers and they buy them from us. But also some of them that are, uh, is, want to establish their own nurseries, they always come for, they pay for consultants. So we offer also services in the uh, nursery establishment and the management, but also uh, supporting uh, some organizations in establishing agroforestry uh, farming systems. Uh, some of our local competitors, I uh, can see at the Bamako Investments, Uganda Tree Resource, and uh, others. At national level, we have the National City Center uh, in Namave which uh, is also dealing in tree seeds and also sometimes seedlings. Uh, our competitive edge, we source high quality seeds. We work with the farmers where we train the farmers that are uh, in the communities, especially youth and women on how to do uh, seed collection. Uh, so, and then in return, we make them our agents that are suppliers uh, with the seeds. Uh, we have built uh, a strong relationship with a big number of farmer uh, groups, institutions within the Oregon region and also the, the whole of Eastern Uganda. Uh, we have experienced team in the planting trees with the crops. Uh, we have a team that have been in this industry for over six years. So, uh, and uh, this is a field that we, we are trained in so we offer what we think is best. That's why we have found that we have been able to move faster for the shortest period that we've been, uh, uh, we incorporated our company. We have been able to move faster because we are in an industry that we understand much better. As achievements, we have raised and sold over 200,000 tree seedlings of over 10 species. We have trained over 1,000 farmers in agroforestry and the non-wood forestry value chain. Uh, we, we have won two prizes uh, in 2019. One was the Land Accelerator Program for Africa by World Resources Institute. We also uh, won a the 2019 National Agribusiness Competition a second best tick climate smart business. We have been able to establish memorandum of understanding with over six client organizations, uh, mentioning but a few, the Rotary Club of South Central, Mbale Rotary Club in promoting agroforestry. And as per now, those projects are even ongoing where we supply, we are supplying uh, for authority, we are supplying, we are supplying a fruit uh, seedlings, but also we offer the technical expertise in establishing uh, these uh, fruit orchards. Uh, with the Rotary Club Mbale, we have a project ongoing, uh, which we offer the technical service uh, to, raise, to establish community tree nurseries. And uh, we, had, uh, we took over that contract. Ezra, where, please wind up. Your time is up. Uh, traction. Uh, since 2018, that we are cooperated, uh, we are able to make sales revenue of 10,000 US dollars. 2019, we had a shoot up where we made 35,000 US dollars in 2020. So far, we have made 20,000 US dollars. We hope uh, we we may not have the equal sales as 2019 due to 
the pandemic, uh, which has destroyed the distribution uh, systems. A growth plan, we hope to establish uh, for nursery trees in Eastern Uganda by 2025, raise and sell of 4 million trees, establish a fruit processing plant to build the non-forestry uh, value chain. Ezra, Ezra yes. I have to stop you here uh, because your time is up. Uh, participants, please make uh, present. Make sure, remember, you have seven minutes to present. Uh, judges, questions? Are there any questions from the judges? Okay. Um, Ezra, what makes uh, your business different, dif really different to these other um, to your competitors? Uh, what, where would you say your your Okay, thank you very much. I would say my business the most different uh, the, uh, compared to other competitors because we are looking at uh, empowering the community, but at the same time uh, making money. I think our business model is unique that uh, as, as we look at empowering communities uh, and also uh, protecting the environment that supports the livelihoods of most of the Ugandans, we at the same time, we, are, we have a clear model of how we are making money. Thank you. Ezra, Ezra please put your budget, uh, please put your video on. Sorry. Yes, um, I basically, uh, I, I have a question on, uh, Sorry? on the issue. Hello? Hello, am um, I saying the host I, has Okay. Oh, hold on. Continue. It's okay. How how big do you actually see this getting? Like, what are the, what are you like really? Uh, if you look at ten years, twenty years, how big does does this get? Uh, sorry. Uh, I beg your pardon. Okay, I was asking how big does this get uh, 10, 20 years from now? Where do you see this going? Uh, I think I see three resources. One, uh, in terms of, uh, of a, uh, expansion, geographical, we see ourselves in 10 years being able to roar across the whole of Uganda. But uh, also, uh, in terms of uh, production, we are looking at diversifying product. In 10 years, we hope to be able to build the whole forestry value chain uh, that we, are, we shall be able to incentivize farmers to plant trees, knowing that, uh, that not only looking at uh, restoring nature or restoring uh, the environment, but also offering a livelihood, a sustainable livelihood to millions of farmers. Thank you. I think Alan had a question that is related to if uh, given that farmers actually, the, given uh, the land fragmentation, where, for example, let's say uh, in Bale or Bududa or what, wherever, given yeah. that uh, the land is fragmented and people have to actually grow crops, how do how is, are the two items balanced? And therefore, have you actually encountered such a situation? And what was your solution to that? I think, Alan, that is a little bit thank, different from the question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that's why we took up a model, like in the region that we are working in currently, uh, in the Mount Erigoni region, uh, maybe in some parts of Eastern Uganda, 
That's why we talk of uh, to uh, the agroforestry farming system, putting in, in the consideration uh, that uh, the people have small land and we cannot talk of uh, establishing woodlots or purely uh, uh, the forestry, uh, pure tree stands, but we you're using the small pieces of land, farmers are able to integrate few trees uh, within uh, their cropping system, farm uh, land system. So uh, uh, basically that's why we are talking of agroforestry, putting in consideration the small acreage of land within the region. Thank you. Hello, Ezra? Yes. And uh, what uh, types uh, of seeds are you? The types of the seeds that we offer? We offer, uh, uh, I would say, three. Yeah. Uh, sorry? We offer three categories of seeds. These are uh, three seeds of three categories the timber. Uh, tree seeds, but we promote a uh, timber species that we know can fit within the agroforestry farming system. We don't offer types of uh, seedlings or seeds of uh, eucalyptus or pine. We offer uh, the, the timber tree seeds and seedlings that can fall within the agroforestry farming system. Uh, two, we offer fruit seeds and also fodder seeds for the seeds, uh, these are seeds for uh, pass for for feeding animals like Cariandra, Lucina, and Sesbania, which are basically to feed animals, uh, which still can be able to uh, promote uh, the livelihoods of farmers who are in the livestock industry. Thank you. There's a, qu there's a question from Brian about land. Because it was saying that uh, currently land is becoming an issue in Uganda and people are cutting down forests in order to grow food. How are you going to get them to grow trees if they are struggling to, grow, to find land to grow food? Uh, I think uh, I, I agree with him, but uh, on the other side, I think that's why tree resource has come in. That if people are cutting trees, people are cutting trees because they knew the traditional farming system where you plant crops alone. But now we are talking of how we can integrate uh, trees within the, the farming system on the farmland, but making sure that, that this does not uh, minimize uh, the production uh, or the yield of crops. And I remember these trees they, are, they give more advantage. One, they restore the soil fertility. Two, they are able to control soil erosion. Three, they are able to offer uh, resilience for crops, especially in the shocks of climate change. Like when during a uh, uh, hot season, trees can be able to offer shade, which I think uh, it is the best way to go. Much as, uh, actually that's why we are here that maybe in 10 years, as we, I said, we can be able to send uh, this gospel across Uganda and maybe East Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Yes. Um, Chap, Chap, are you ready to present? Ezra, please uh, turn off your video. Yes, Chap, Chap is ready. Okay, please share screen. Anyone see it? Yes, you can see it. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Start. My name is Wamambe Christian Maeku, and I'm the head of operations at Chap Chap Africa. Um, small and medium enterprises are pillars for many of our African economies. And for decades, 
they've enabled innovation, trade, and even job creation. In fact, many of us have been fed, sheltered, and even educated because of the livelihoods gained from such businesses. And yet today, they still struggle to access credit, financial services, supply chains, and even technology. This is because they are considered informal and even small. The vision of ChapChap is to formalize such businesses to help them remain resilient. And we believe we are the key solution to enabling over 15 million businesses to obtain sustainable growth. But how do we intend to do this? First, we would like to help these businesses digitize their business process so that they have verifiable records. Today, the government has released over a trillion shillings under UDB to help businesses recover from COVID. But only formalized businesses will be able to access these funds, showing the disadvantage of being an informal and unrecorded business. Secondly, we want to remove the element of cash in their business. This helps them become more transaction worthy and reduces the risk of loss. Third, we want to use the data generated from these business activities to form a wonderful financial profile and unlock unsecured credit for these businesses because they do not even have collateral. And lastly, we want to create a link between them and the distributors of the products they have so that they can earn better margins. But how are we doing this? At ChapChap, we've built an all-in-one smartphone application that enables any user to access all our services from one touch point as and when they need them and from where, anywhere in the country. Our application is integrated into the day-to-day -day activities of any business owner, allowing them to keep track of the stock in their business, the sales they make, and even the payments they receive. In addition, we provide them an opportunity to even make some more revenue by providing financial services to the people within the communities they serve by providing products such as mobile money. The result of this is they are able to build a credible business profile and access credit to finance their businesses. Our ERP solution will help businesses access credit for the first time, allowing such businesses compete favorably with medium and large scale industries where businesses access products on credit. The visibility we create for these businesses allows them to bargain for even better margins from distributors. And this helps impact the low income population that they serve as they get better prices for key products like soap, sugar, and even salt. By providing financial services, we bring key solutions to the populations that are in need, especially since the majority are in the rural areas. They now no longer need to walk long distances to access financial services, such as savings, credit, and even insurance. In addition, there's an opportunity to provide employment for youth in their communi communities as their sales agents for products such as mobile money. The impact of our solution is felt very quickly. And within six months, the majority of our businesses have more customers served because they have a wider variety of products and services to offer. The better margins that they get from our solution allows them to build up their capital and even access credit, which is nearly two times what they have in investment. The potential for this solution is large. And today we have over 12 million businesses across the African continent demanding for such services. And it's expected for them to be about 56 million within the next five years. However, we can't serve all of them alone. And we are looking to crowd in partners to help serve at least 1 million businesses over the next five years. Our revenue model is pretty simple. And we earn a transaction fee for every transaction facilitated by the businesses on our network. We also charge a one-time subscription fee for any business that is being onboarded onto our platform. 
and all revenues generated are shared with the businesses that participate in helping us provide services to low-income earners. We are a fast-growing business, and over the next five years, we are hoping to generate at least 100 million US dollars in annual revenues. Our competitive advantage mainly comes from our ability to forge worthwhile partnerships with businesses, communities, service providers, and even development partners, because this helps us leverage opportunities such as internet access, smartphones, and even technology to provide the right solutions for our customers. Today, we have been able to serve at least 7,000 businesses, and they depend on us to provide key services to over 5 million unbanked customers. And through these partnerships, we've been able to digitize and facilitate transactions worth $11 million since 2018. This has earned us awards like the Global Unilever Young Entrepreneur Award. And now we are part of Africa's ANPI Heroes and the Global Prosperity Prize, which we hope to represent Uganda well. This is because of our lead team, which brings together experience in management of last mile businesses that every day serve low income earners. In addition, we blend this with our professional skills in human resource management, marketing, finance, and even technology. And we crowd in strategic provider service advisors such as the University of Cambridge and Pum Netherlands to help us achieve this. But we cannot do this alone. This is a very large vision. And so we do our best to bring in as many partners to support this goal. Today, we ask you to join us in our struggle to create harmony among people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, uh, judges, any questions? Yes, I have a question in relation to the number of businesses already served. Again, it's the revenue generated. So you say that you've already served uh, sev about 7,000. 7, but when I looked at your revenue, uh, uh, revenue generated curve, it seems like from um, two, I think maybe if I could see it again, but you have basically, it's almost like 2020, is when you actually expect to, to start generating revenue. So could you just clarify? So just for clarity, uh, the revenue curve, in fact, we have been revenue positive since the very beginning. However, because we serve low income businesses, in terms of profitability, we have been negative, we've been earning negative uh, profits up until 2019, where we now made, we broke even. This is mainly because our target population cannot afford the services as a unit. But as we build a larger base of businesses and customers, we're able to meet these costs and even generate more revenue. OK, I think now I see it more clearly. So thanks. Um, okay, so customers don't pay for the enterprise resource planning software. Um, so customers They're, pay- You're just using that as a way to, to get them onto the platform. Uh, yes, okay, how businesses much is pay $5 as at, at registration, and that's the only fee they pay for the platform. There's a question about the smartphone use. Okay. Uh, just waiting for Brent to type it. I'm assuming it is um, 
uh, given that it's a smartphone, it's a smartphone app, are people yes. able to use this? And especially yes. given that how do you expect to tap into low income earners who have very few smartphones? Okay, that, that's a very good question. So how our model works is we leverage the smartphone owner. So today we have at least 6 million smartphones all over Uganda, but the majority of the people are using them for personal use, for social media and for calls, but not for business. And what we have found is that when we approach these smartphone owners and give them a value proposition where they can earn money off their phone, they are comfortable using the smartphone for the business. And we provide the, the ecosystem. So as a business user, I'm able to serve 80 or more customers who do not have a smartphone, but need a financial service or a digital service. So we have a, a merchant a business to customer model, as well as a business to business to customer model, which is what mainly works for the low income earners, especially in the rural communities. All right. Uh, do you have, uh, judges, are there any other questions? Okay, uh, Brian has expanded on his question. Is a question is, how about those smart? How about those low-income earners who don't have smartphone? Who don't have smartphones? Because you yes. said six so million then, have have smartphones. Uganda has a population of about forty-four million. That is about thirty-eight million. Are you going to access those ones? Yes. So for the uh, low-income earners who do not have smartphones, they are able to go to a small business that is using ChapChap and transact through that business. The same way if I want to send money to someone maybe in Europe, but I don't have an account in Europe, I can go to the nearest banking hall, which will then provide the service on my behalf. So we have small, a network of small businesses, the 7,000, who then provide services to those unbanked customers who do not even have a smartphone. Okay, uh, could I then uh, have, a, I have a follow up question on that. Uh, what is the typical um, average turnover of your typical client, the one actually who has the smartphone? Uh, yes, so the turnover for most of our clients who have smartphones is about 700,000 Uganda shillings per day. That is a blend of reselling products like airtime and water and electricity, as well as providing mobile money deposit and withdrawal services. All right. All right, judges, do you have any other questions? We'll, okay, Why do a... people use ChatChat for transactions? Pardon? Hello, uh, Leo, could you repeat the question? Yes. Okay. So, what is the advantage of using ChatChat as for, for transactions um, um, and rather than mobile money? So, the main one is in terms of uh, the requirements. So your typical low income business is informal. So they do not have a trading license. Um, they do not have high startup capital. Uh, most of them will even start with about $10 as their investment. For you to access products such as mobile money, you have to have high KYC. So you are banked business with all the registration documents and you need at least $400 in terms of startup income. Whereas our businesses do not have that. And the requirements for joining ChapChap would simply be having $5 and a national ID, allowing any business owner or any first time entrepreneur to be onboarded and resell these services without the strains of the requirements. Uh, secondly, it's in terms of infrastructure. So most uh, interoperable solutions require you to have hardware such as a point of sale terminal, which again costs you around $400. So consider a university student 
who want to be able to earn a living. They cannot deploy $400 into hardware and then look for an additional $200 to finance the business. When they join ShopChap, it eliminates all those requirements and they use, they can start with as little as they can raise. And as they grow their transactions, they are able to access unsecured credit through us to even scale better. Uh, there are two more questions. One is from Ali. He's asking, will ChapChap be lending money or capital to ChapChap to ChapChap subscribers? And the second question is, on the B2C model, how do you guarantee confidentiality, information security? Um, so lending, the current lending product we have is for the MSMEs. However, as our value proposition grows as a company, we will look into lending to subscribers. Um, the next question, uh, could you just repeat it as I was um, answering? Beatrice, Beatrice Nyumba, who is on yes. listening to the to the event online on the Entrepreneurship World Cup website, is asking, yes. how do you guarantee confidentiality on the B2C model? So yes, so we are currently part of an, the Association of Financial Technology Service Providers, FITSPA, and we work closely with the Ministry of ICT to help us maintain compliance, compliance in terms of data protection, not only for the individual's personal data, but also financial information. And with all our service providers, we have contracts that protect personal data. All right, uh, any other questions, judges? Uh, one, would you say you're a money lending? company would you say you are a enterprise uh enterprise development company how would you describe yourself because you have various revenue streams so i just wanted to understand which one are you really or which one are you aspiring to be so we are aspiring to be an enterprise solution but how we address it is because we know the market failures are numerous, what we do is provide a platform onto which other service providers can come on to help the MSMEs. For example, we do not lend money to the MSMEs. We, pro we get partners who are micro lenders looking to provide uh, micro credit to SMEs. And then they build a value proposition which is onboarded onto our application. Because as a startup, we cannot do everything. And we do not want to disrupt what already exists. We want to enhance the existing infrastructure. All right, Christian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next up is Ayuda Business Clinic. Uh, Christian, please stop your video. Uh, blessing, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, do you want to play your video your side? No, I think you should play it that side because it's just a... oh, Okay, give me a minute. Give me a minute. The, so the, they're now sending some to the group. Uh, Christian, Uh, yes, please. Please mute. Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Blessing and I'm the team leader for Ayuda Legal Business Clinic. Ayuda Business Legal Clinic is a legal business center that is aimed at uh, Were you able to see the video? Uh, no, it's not 
moving. Okay, hold on. It's improving businesses, especially. Can you, were you able to see the video now? Yes. Okay, let me play it. Hello, my name is Blessing and I'm the team leader for Ayuda Legal Business Clinic. Ayuda Business Legal Clinic is a legal business center that is aimed at improving businesses, especially macro, micro, and medium enterprises, specifically with the youth and the women that are struggling to improve their businesses. There has been a tale that Uganda is one of the biggest entrepreneurial countries in the world. We register over 2,000 companies that are supposed to carry out businesses. But of course, that's all we are celebrated for. We do not monitor to see the growth and the development of these businesses. So many businesses do not last to celebrate first anniversary. And this is because they have failed to compete favorably with the already existing players in the market. And the main issues that we can highlight is that they have failed to totally comply with the legal, with the legal information that is needed, the compliance that is needed, be it tax compliance, be it legal registration, standardization of the products, and so many others. The main reason is that they are, they are very expensive, the acquisition process is very cumbersome and lengthy, and people get disappointed and eventually are kicked out of the market, but there are already business players in Uganda. What does Ayuda Legal Business Clinic do? We assist with the registration of company registration or any other business entity. We assist with the cop copywriting and trademarking of the services or goods that are produced by individuals. We assist with standardization of products. We assist with trade uh, and tax compliance and any other licenses that are required by businesses to perform and boost their own growth. The other bit that we do is that we provide online research, online and physical research for any other trade-related and legal-related business ideas, uh, concepts, and so many others. We do trainings to young people, to macro, micro, and medium enterprises to be able to appreciate what they need legally to run their businesses. So at our centers, we have uh, worked out an automated system that provides all the information that is needed to these entrepreneurs that are getting into the business. Is it a uh, business registration, standardization of, proper, of uh, the products, uh, tax compliances, and uh, maybe copyright and trademarking of the services that are produced by these particular people that are joining the market. But mainly is that they're able to access all these services online. We're developing applications in different languages that are mobile applications and that are user-friendly for everyone to be able to afford these services. The way we are doing it in a unique way is that we are able to provide these services without charging the no more amounts that is too much and too expensive for these entities. We're able to go out there, get partners, get grants, and only require from these particular entrepreneurs the stamp duty that is paid by the government. Who are our target groups? Our target groups are mainly the people that are just joining the market. Those are the small and medium enterprises, the young entrepreneurs that are just joining the market, the women, and mainly those startups that have not taken off for the last five years, they're just starting up, among others. What is AIDA's potential impact on job creation and also business boost? in just not Uganda, but the rest of the world. Ayuda is able to provide in a unique way employment indirectly and directly. With Ayuda centers, we're able to employ over 300 workers in the different centers, both online and physically, because we carry out the activities that we mentioned above. But indirectly, we want to be able to impact other people by making the business, by sustaining the businesses and leveling them up. We are able to keep very, very many businesses in running their businesses 
and they are able to improve their businesses and employ more people. That means that if we have a target of employing over 300 people just at the Ayuda centers, we have the capacity of employing over 1,000 people in all the other companies that we help out in building, in training, and in also legal ad advisory that we always give them. Uh, we have a great expectations because the employment levels will increase because of these particular centers. Where does Ayuda derive its funding? Like we originally stated, Ayuda is a company limited by guarantee. Of course, eventually we intend to do a social enterprise, but at the end of the day, we need to help these people while we get funding. So we get funding from contributions from our directors, we get funding from partners, we get funding from grants so that we're able to develop these people. Because if you overcharge them, then you will take them back to the place where they're not going to develop. So that is why we apply to different uh, grants so that we're able to partner with them and boost the growth of business and entrepreneurship abilities in the different companies in Uganda. Since we started in 2018, we've impacted 500 companies. We've helped them with trainings, we've helped them with illustrations, we've helped them with all the services that they legally require to be able to boost their businesses. We have a target of impacting over 1 million companies not just in Uganda, but the rest of East Africa. And with the aid of uh, Entrepreneur World Cup, we shall be able to boost these centers. We shall be able to build the different centers in different districts so that people are able to access all the information and the services that they need. In conclusion, Ayuda does not provide basic information, but it deals with the root cause of all the business failures in not just Uganda, but the rest of the world. After uh, dealing with that root cause, that means that we are building up a good foundation for the growth and the development of business sectors in Uganda. Ayuda is available to boost the growth of businesses in just not Uganda, but the rest of the world. All right. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, judges, did you able to follow the video? Yes, uh, I was able to follow the video. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. When when you say talk tax compliance, what do you mean by that? And then uh, when you say because basically you're using uh, grants as your main uh, income source. So how many grants do you, have you gotten each year since you, you formed? And then when you say you have uh, supported 500 companies, do you, in training and other services, how many have you actually supported with service, not training, service? Uh, thank you so much. Is it possible for me to share my video? The uh, host has been I'm sharing my video. Uh, yeah, you can share your video. You want to share your screen? No, no, just the video. Again? No. Mm. My video. I think she wants to, to be online when she's yes. responding. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I do not understand. Okay, like she wants to be able to, for us to see her when she's responding. So yeah. I she can be able to do that. No, you they're, they're telling me you cannot uh share oh. you can that video because the host has stopped it. Okay. Hold on. Okay, there you go. Oh all right. Thank you so much. Uh, I got a question. I, I didn't get the first question about tax compliance. When you compliance. say tax compliance, what do you mean? What exactly do you do? All right, this is what we do for tax compliance. One is that we get these uh, small enterprises and startups and we train them on the different things they need to know in regards to taxation in Uganda. And then we also train them on filing annual returns and any other compliance. We help them in registering for TINs because most of the taxes need when you have a registered TIN. 
We help them register 14. We help them uh, uh, file returns if they are not able to file. But most of the times we encourage them to learn to file these returns. So we take them through sessions when they can learn how to file returns, the importance of filing returns, the benefits of, of, of doing taxes, of paying taxes, among others. So most of these people come, most of these companies come when they do not know about taxes at all. So we have to start from the beginning and explain to them the different taxes and the compliance systems that have been set in place to be able to file taxes. Um, sorry, let me add on that before you go to the next uh, response. When you say uh, they, you're basically training them to file returns, who are you training in the SME to, to file returns? Um, we always require them to send accountants or anyone in line who is trained to be doing the same, either a finance manager or the accountants or any other person in the company that they have identified who is able to take on that particular task in their companies or uh, organization or entities. Okay. Uh, and then, and then for, for how many grants have we used so far? Uh, we have so far gotten two short grants that we, that we used so far, but also it is important to note that when we were trying to explain, we said that if we do not have grants, then we only charge, uh, we only charge a stamp duty that is required. With the stamp duty that you need from the government, you're able to register anything that you need. So we don't incur a cost. The only cost that we incur is the cost of maybe moving to file the documents from one agency to another. But if, if a company or an entity or a business entity has, has paid a stamp duty that the government requires you to pay, then we use the short grants that we have available to be able to carry the extra costs that we have. And then we help in, in registration of the different uh, services that they might need as our clients. Uh, there's a question from, uh, okay, I have from one. Brian. Okay, sorry. There's, uh, there's one more that, had, uh, that uh, the judge had asked about, uh, she inquired that out of the 500 companies that we have been able to train, how many have we actually provided services for? We have provided services for 350 uh, different services. Most of them come in line with uh, company registration as the start. Some of them come when they want to start a uh, payment of taxes, so we do teen registrations for them. We are working on a process of standardization. Right now, we, we are in the process of getting max, Q max for over 50 companies, and it's already in the pipeline. So yes, we have taken on 350 out of the 500 that we indicated above to, to carry out actual services to them. There is a question about your your sustainability, both on the on the website, on the live stream, and here from one of the judges, is that you seem to not have a revenue model. Because how are you earning money? Because you seem to be more of an NGO. So in case everybody gets registered, who will you be serving? Uh, the second question around this is. Uh, most of the statutory fees are higher than legal fees. And this is the reason why most of the businesses are not compliant. So it is still about your business model. How do you earn money minus grants? And like I earlier indicated in the video, uh, when we registered this company, it is supposed to be a social enterprise. It's a company limited by guarantee. It has an option of, of, of the social enterprise. That means that apart from this offer that we're giving to the uh, small and medium enterprises, there's a particular section of the enterprise that actually brings in an income for people that can afford it. So yes, for this particular section, the legal clinic that we provide for small and medium enterprises and startups, it is supposed to be supported by grants, but we have another section for uh, the social enterprise has another section that brings in an income, an income to the to the uh, company. And then, secondly, again from Brian, is do you have a digital platform? Yes, we do have a digital. 
platform. We have uh, we have a running website www at ayudaligo clinic at uh, at dot com. It is running. It is running, and yes, we are also working on our mobile uh, platforms that are going to be running in just one month. Okay, I I have a, a question on your team. Could you basically highlight the competencies? How many people are there, and what are the competencies of the team? We have uh, we have nine permanent uh, heads of department. We have uh, two uh, partners. That is uh, myself, Om Shablessing Immaculate. I am a lawyer by profession. I also hold a postgraduate uh, diploma in legal practice and also hold a postgraduate diploma in tax administration. Together with Nachimera Sharon, she also ho holds the same. We have uh, three legal officers. Uh, that is uh, Bernard Ainamani. He holds the same qualifications. We have um, uh, Emmanuel Tumhaise. He holds the same qualifications. And Nada Iclea, she holds the same qualifications. We have our head of finance who holds a, a bachelor's in finance and also holds a postgraduate uh, degree, sorry, a master's degree in MBA and also a CPA. Uh, Maggie Bavidia, she's the one who handles our uh, work, our um, accounting work. And we also have the head of admin administration uh, her name is Nasali, Nasali Esther. She holds a degree in, uh, in Bachelor's of uh, Administration. Uh, we also have our head of IT who helps with the innovations and the upgrading of the mobile applications that we are working on. His name is uh, Koshao uh, Godfrey. He, is, he, he holds a degree in uh, Business Computing. And uh, that's the, just the top management. Of course, we have, uh, we have registered quite a number of volunteers that are helping us with the activities that we are running, and also the receptionist and the admin. That's, that's what we have running. OK, there is a, one other question from uh, Alan Bryan. He's asking, from the profit side, the for-profit side of your, of your venture, how much income do you get from it in average per month? Um, the average amount that we get per month is uh, six million in our profit, and the reason uh, the reason this is reflected is because ma majorly most of our effort is now on our on this particular section that we're trying to do so that we are, we're able to help startups and other businesses. When you eventually help these startups and other businesses, eventually they become your clients on the other side and they're able to give you the, to pay the pricing that you set up. So the reason why we're not over focusing on the profit part right now is because we're trying to balance and develop both areas, the profit, uh, profit side and then the non-profit side. Okay, Kevin, you had something to say? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, I know this is not necessarily the advisory session of this. Uh, this is judging. But one of the things, if you are saying that your income is basically going to come from grants, I would expect to hear that you have like a grants manager who is focused on looking for those grants so that you can actually have it enough to uh, provide the impact you want to provide. And then also I expected to hear that the, the finance person, since they're a CPA, are the ones actually in charge of training uh, the training the training and providing services in relation to uh, taxes so that then I'm able to be a little bit comfortable with the fact that you are actually providing compliance uh, related uh, tax advice. So not an advisory session, but I thought you would, it probably pro provided some value. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. This is uh, well noted. I, I just didn't get an opportunity to go into the details of what each of the heads does at, the, at AYUDA, 
But uh, like you've rightly put it, yes, our head of, of finance is actually the one who heads the trainings in charge of taxes with other people that qualify for tax trainings. And yes, we also have a grant manager. A gra our grant manager is, uh, is Sharon. She's the one who handles our applications for the grant and she's in charge of, as a partner, she's the one in charge of grant management. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, blessing. Judges, any other comments or questions before we go on to Henry? Okay, thank you. Thank you, blessing. Uh, okay, uh, can we, Henry, are you ready? Henry? Henry? Uh, Shoni, are you there? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Do you want to share your screen or I share mine? You can share from your side and then uh, what you can help me is to take me off the video in case I am there so that we can have uh, no interference with the network. Okay, fine. Give me a second. Let me share screen. Uh, can you see my screen? I can see it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, the organizers of the Entrepreneurship World Cup, uh, Coin with Uganda, where every coin counts. My name is uh, Shoni Batenga, the CEO and founding director of Coin with Uganda. I will go straight into uh, the problem statement. Our statistics stand like this. Only 16% of the adult population keep their savings in a formal banking institute. That is by Sarah Fahad from World Bank. And Dr. Kaseke de Lewis, the deputy governor, says this, that the reality is that regardless of what you do for a living or how much you earn, saving is an issue that we all struggle with. So if the statistics are showing us like this, what is the problem? 85% of Uganda's population is in the informal sector. People do not have access to information on saving. These people in the informal sector cannot access financing due to the little or no knowledge. Please, you can stop there, stop there. I'll tell you to go to the next slide. These people who are in the informal sector, for example, people doing businesses by the roadside, people in farming, in poultry, how do they improve their businesses if they cannot access financing because of no collaterals or securities or they do not have accounts? So the question is why? Why don't they have accounts? That is what Coinworth comes in to solve. To have access, you can go to the next, ne next slide. Coinworth comes in to bring in access to information or bring information closer to the people who are bringing in daily minimal earnings. People in this sector who do not have information, we have to give them information through our agent system. For example, Let's go, let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is how we work. Our agent system, the agents are trained, they are picked from the communities and trained about financial literacy. These are the same agents we send out to the field to help the people understand saving, that for you to save, you don't have to have a lot of money. Even a coin shilling or a hundred shilling can start you on your journey of saving. When we look at our closest competition, which is the banks, the MFIs, the circles, the VSLAs, and now the mobile money, they have limited or they have cut out 
the population, which is the biggest population that has the coin shilling or that has the lowest unit of Uganda's currency. So CoinWorth comes in to bring on board people such as this one by giving them knowledge on banking and providing a platform where if they have very little, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please continue. Okay, people who have very little money, for example, 100 shillings, can start their banking journey. People who cannot make lines or queue up in banks can have an agent that picks that money from them on a daily. People who cannot access financial services like credit because of lack of securities can go and access it through clustering them into groups from the communities where they come from and they can start their journey of improving their businesses. Can we go to the next slide? Can we go to the next slide? Next slide. Next slide. Okay, when our agents come back, we can see them counting the money and then reporting it back to the office. So what is the solution that we are providing? CoinWorth comes in to offer this platform. People like these ones are older people who cannot move from their areas, but also need, and they're still doing businesses. For example, these ladies are doing roadside businesses. They are roasting maize by the roadside. They need some little credit, even if it is 10,000 shillings. So this is what we do with our agents. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. This is our potential. Uh, we have been in existence for a long time, but we were registered formally in March 2019, and we have been in position to register 3,000 members. Can you go back? Back a bit? Can you go back a bit? We have been in position to register 3,000 members, and this is our target. We want by the end of 2021 to have 10,000 members. And in this, we shall fetch 27,000 US dollars in only registration. Our loan portfolio, when it stands, can you go to the next now? A bit, can you go to the next? Thank you. We hope to have a loan portfolio. A bit, next slide. A bit, next slide. I'm sorry about my internet. I hope you can hear me. A bit. I can hear. Which slide do you want? A bit, next slide. Which slide? Or well, the business model slide. A bit, next slide. Okay, the next one, go to the next now. Yeah, go to the business model. So we hope by close of 20, okay, we hope by the close of 2021 to have a loan portfolio of uh, 420,000 US dollars, and this one will fetch us by close of 2021, 82,000 US dollars as profit. And we are proud to have made partnerships with the, the government of Uganda through the district and also the microfinance support center by signing an MOU. And we are hoping to bring on board other partners that will be uh, necessary in improving or pushing the model of CoinWorth to the people so that people can start saving and start access to uh, services or financial services like credit and also emergency funds. Thank you very much. We are uh, a team of 27 people who work at the office with 21 as the agents and also the high office, which has uh, me as a, the chairperson, uh, Monica, as the secretary general, we have Mr. Mulumba. All these are qualified 
uh, people. I did not have a chance to, uh, to, to, to put the photos because I, the weight was too big. I removed them. But yeah, that is Coinworth. We hope uh, to bring Uganda and revolutionize uh, the saving of Uganda, but also improve the businesses through credit solutions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Shani. Welcome. Uh, judges, any questions? Okay, uh, I have a question. Yes. I just need a clarification on what your business is. Would you say that, I, I, I'm a little bit confused. Would you say you are a circle? Are you a company? Why, if you are like, for example, a circle, why would uh, someone in a rural community move from their circle to your circle. So I just need to understand a little bit more. Could you explain? Thank you very much. By registration, we are a community-based organization with a vision of bringing everybody to save. Uh, why somebody can move from their circle or their VSLA to this one is uh, the, the coin shilling the availability of an agent that goes and picks money from the stalls on a daily is why somebody can move from their circle or VSLA or even an MFI to coin one. Uh, Shani, there's a question from both Ali and Brian. They're asking, yes. Is coin worth a circle? Is it a microfinance? What is it exactly? Because you said yes, CBO, but CBO in which category? Yes. Mm -hmm. So which category are yes. you in? Which category are you in? A yes circle you said or a microfinance? But by registration. But by registration, we are a CBO. We hope to provide an um, when we grow in. Finance, but current to bring on board everybody to services to people who have been kicked out of the mainstream banking system. I can see, I can see that we said we are governed and regulated by the districts where we operate from. The district had an, has an audit on every month. Uh, Shani, we maybe are you can currently your video. based in Wakiso. I can see somebody asking. It, it means a community-based organization. Yeah. Where are we based? We are based. We are based in Wakiso. And uh, that is where I said we are regulated by the district. Every area we move in, we work with the local authorities, but also we have the governing arm of the of the government through the districts or the local governments. I can see a question that CBOs are not licensed, are not licensed to, they are licensed, especially now in the government program that they call a MIOGA that has been put down to the different parishes and the villages. That is where we are operating. We have actually signed a contract uh, to work with uh, the, 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 the microfinance support. 
I think uh could you get off your video because it's affecting I I, I think it's affecting uh what to we hear bring on board as many people as possible to access financing through the Yoga, which is the current government program. Okay. I, I am off. Um, okay. Can I go on reading the, the different questions? Yeah, community-based organization, but we want to grow into oh. one. Okay, you are saying that uh, you yeah, you are working as a CBO and you yes. are referring to the new current program. Uh, so yeah. my question is, when did you actually start? Because when you started, I don't think the current program was, uh, was ongoing and also regulation uh, yes. on that. The regulation is simply that CBOs cannot collect the money. So uh, could you just clarify? The, the CBO that is bringing on board uh, a, 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 to, to, to close the gap of people who are not saving, we, were, we are regulated directly under the community service of the district, which is the Wakiso community office, where we are mandated to help people understand that the, the, the importance of saving through starting with as little as they have. But then from mo moving from there, the arm that helps us to carry out the lending or uh, the credit, we have signed an MOU with the microfinance center where we hope to grow another arm that is going to be a microfinance. So currently we are lend okay the ownership of, of, of a CBO is not for an individual for the people on top. So whatever they choose to do with their money, whether it is to lend uh, or improve their businesses, that is done by the community. Okay, how many districts are you operating in? We are operating currently in only one district, that is Wakiso, because we started in uh, 2019. Why not? Seems to be heavily dependent on government goodwill, and also seems to be tied whatever district they have agreements with. Well, uh, for people to start, because you see what we are doing again. Much of the arm is to provide impact in the in the community, the impact of change of behavior from not saving to saving. So we need a lot of political from the government. Okay, does this mean how do they that... build trust and how... okay, yes. please? Yes. Uh, does does this basically mean that in Wakiso where you are registered, yes. you 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 are part of the CBO members, and because ideally if a CBO is uh, in fact uh, collecting money, it means including you as the staff have also to be collecting money and you shouldn't yes. have an unfair advantage when it comes to leadership in terms of uh, the board. So my question is, uh, how are you navigating that? Okay. Yes, uh, we are part of the community. Where I come is actually where I stay. I am part of the community in, in Wakiso. So even in the voting, they voted me for the chair, chairpersonship. So if, in case I finish my tenure, we shall vote another person into the board. We do have a technical team, the one that sits at, at the office, 
that runs the management of the finances. That one is different from the team that takes decision for the organization. I hope I am, I am being gotten clearly. Yeah, you can go back to answering what is in the chat. Uh, uh, VSLA as are equally same as CBOs. Yeah, yes, actually right now they are taking the VSLAs into CBOs. Uh, all the VSLAs are supposed to register and then go get uh, papers from the parish and then have a circle at uh, the, the, the constituency uh, level. So, so now I think where we differ uh, a lot from the VSLAs is that VSLAs limit withdraws. They kind of say we are going to save our money maybe for a year and then everyone will get their equal, equal share. But uh, what we are doing is somebody who has started their journey of saving, any um, time they want their money, they can come and pick it. I How think that is why you are actually not, um, because the idea is, I think one of the things is really, really read the law so that you are working within the confines of the law and what you are allowed and not allowed to do. Because at the moment, it seems like you are playing almost like uh, a circle, but you are operating as a CBO. So try to, 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 to like really, really look at that. Okay. Okay. Um, we do have a team of advisors as well. Because at the, at the um, uh, conception of uh, the idea, we put on board a number of players and they have been advising us on which uh, 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 steps to take from even the, the registration. We were disturbed a lot by the regulators who is going to regulate um, the, 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 the CBO until there was uh, an opening in, uh, in uh, the opening in the district where the district can oversee the monies that are collected in, the, in that district through their audit office. So that, uh, that is where we are now. Coinworth seems to be a good concept, except I don't fully see how it can scale out as a business. If Shani can throw more light on on that or refine it, then it will be clearer. So this is how the business works. If we can expand, for example, I have said we are looking at ourselves growing one arm, leave alone the arm that helps people to get into the habit of saving. There's one arm that want to grow into a microfinance because the moment you have numbers, the big numbers, if we have 3000 and we are looking at having 10,000 by close of next year, it means all these people want to have a loan or credit or improvement in their business. With our agent team, we can grow to as many people, people from there who can work with the community. We bring them on board and interview them. If they have the uh, required qualifications, we take them on and then they work in that community and they liaise with the people from the office. So its growth cannot be limited. It cannot be limited because the need is actually there and the people do not know and they really want to save because as we speak today, our saving portfolio is at 189,000 uh, uh, million shillings uh, in dollars. Uh, that was uh, about 169,000 US dollars. So I hope to grow it to more than 500,000 US dollars by close of next year. So the, the business concept is really there. Okay, Connie, thank you very much. Uh, let's go on to the next, let's go on to the next presenter.
the next and final presenter. Henry, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Please start your, let me see. Can you start your video? Yeah, I've started. Okay. Do you want me to run your presentation for you or do you want to do it yourself? Please do it from that side. Okay. Give me a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Is this your presentation? Yeah, it is. Okay. Should I start? Yes, you, you can begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Henry Wandera. I'm representing Strategic Resource Group. And um, our project is called Reliancy Agribusiness. Um, our team comprises of uh, Ingenabi Wandera, who has got over 30 years experience in consulting work with World Bank, EU, UN habitants, and is the one who developed this concept, which I'm sharing today. We also have Edmond and myself as the operation manager. A bit both slides. So what's the problem you're trying to solve here? Uh, if you've been in Uganda, you all realize that uh, Uganda produces surplus grain. Of this surplus grain which is produced, 96% is done by smallholder, or what we call subsistence farmers. And due to this, uh, they get low yields, and those low, uh, low yields are because they do it on the subsistence level. And also there is post harvest management, and because of this, there is a poor disposal. There is this poor disposal, and this exposes their grain to pests, uh, deco decomposition, and thing to mention, but they a few. Then there is also limited access to market. They don't have market intelligence, as in they don't know when to buy and when to sell. So this forces them to sell at their earliest possible opportunity. Uh, so how do you intend to solve this problem? I bet you can. Can we go to the next slide, please? OK, the way we intend to solve this problem is we buy grid dry then we bulk the grain onto the east african exchange uh, market which is digital and by doing this we shall be forming centers where we shall be bulking the stock and farmers will directly sell to those centers in their different localities and uh, our goal of doing this is um, uh, forming farmers into smaller groups. So when we form farmers into smaller groups and they access the centers, they will increase their profitability and will be issued uh, with uh, a receipt. And we have to keep in mind why farmers sell at an early age. 
or at uh, an earliest opportunity is because they, they want quick money. So by pro, uh, we shall provide the solution to that by giving them bridging capital or money which they can be using as a way for the sale to increase. Slide number six. Uh, because there has been an uh, absence of operation warehousing receipt system, that may, uh, the buyers who tend to buy from Uganda have not been in position to buy graded maize. Uh, farmers don't grade the maize uh, due to lack of the maximum price or good price on the market. By grading the maize on arrival to our warehouses on, and putting it on the East African exchange, this problem will be eliminated. And therefore, farmers will be entrusting us with their grain, and also we shall be in position to cater for that problem of price fluctuations. Also, the buyers who tend to get the maize will be in position, or they will trust us that we shall be in position to give them good grain, because we've graded it, we've braided it, and we have the numbers due to the warehousing system. We'll go to slide number seven. Our core activities uh, will be warehousing receipt system. How does this operate? The receipt system operates in the way that when farmers bring in their grain, they come in into groups. It's not all of the farmers who come, but their group representative with the grain, they are issued with a receipt of the quantities of the grain they brought to the store and uh, uh, what grade is it and things like that. Then uh, we shall give them capital, what we call bridging capital. This is the capital between when they bring in the, their grain and the right time to sell. So we shall give them that capital which they will be using in the meantime as the prices uh, stabilize on the market. And also we shall be bulking and marketing all the grain on the East African Grain Exchange um, to large mirrors from Kenya and institution buyers like World Food Programs, schools, to mention but a few. Uh, our setup capital per center is 19 million 590 US Uganda shillings, which is equivalent to 500, 5 million US dollars. That is per center. We intend to have around five centers in different regions, which grow a lot of grain or maize. Uh, our cash flow projection, these are the assumptions for our cash flow projection. Cash flow projection are presumed on the numbers of assumption principle of which are that maize production will raise with increasing consumption driven by population growth. That uh, once we, the population grows, also the consumption of maize grows. Why does it grow? Because maize is a stable food on most of East African countries, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, to mention but a few. That's why it is mostly used in schools, prisons, hospital. So we are shown as the number in population grows, also the maize consumption will also grow. Real price remain constant in real terms over the period, but absolute value raise with inflation. When inflation raise, also our price we expect it to raise. Inflation rate will follow the inflation curve. And also population served will grow with the rates. Uh, next slide a bit. Uh, so these are the centers we intend to start up. Uh, Henry, you're frozen. Oh. Can you hear me now? Hello, Henry. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay. You can hear me now. Yes. 
Okay, uh, these are the different centers we intend to start up in Uganda. Uh, a total revenue for the farmers because we are for profit and we intend the TEA project intends to make around uh, 177 millions and of that 200 million will be for the farmers revenue and then the population we intend to serve is uh, 742 in Uganda. Can we have the next slide please? So from uh, the future opportunities we intend to have because of these five centers we intend to start off, we shall be having a milling and packaging of maize flour because not all the maize that will be pro brought to our centers will qualify to go to the East African exchange. Therefore, it will leave us with ungraded maize or the maize which doesn't qualify to be of that grade. Therefore, we shall make that maize into maize and because of me uh, removing our habit in Uganda, we 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 don't we mill maize, we mill posho, then we remove the husk. That husk is very good for animal. So we shall also have livestock feeds, which is used for poultry, fishery, and dairy. Then because we have those centers and we have the feed on place, we can start and the vegetable model gardens, then the fruit garden, then the maize farm. Then on the same center, we can start a vocational training institute because we have uh, the manure, which is given to the animal and the animal needs to be tended to. So the people who are tending to those animals, they will get vocational skills. And uh, can I go to the next slide? And those vocational skills, they will give them experience to be in position to do the same, to teach the same that, that they have learned to other people. Hence, the project will be growing. In 2017, in conclusion, in 2017 only, Uganda produced around four metric tons of maize. Because of this bumper harvest, uh, the prices of maize collapsed and uh, price went as low as 250 shilling per kilo, which is way, way too low and discourages farmers. Uganda being an agricultural country, instituting measure that will pre preserve the livelihood of smallholders small and support post-COVID economic recovery is very urgent. That's why this project is needed at such a, a time post-COVID. And also this project demonstrated that agriculture has potential to significantly contribute to Uganda's economic growth and poverty reduction while securing regional food security at the same time. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And in brief, that's the project all about. May God bless the Alliance Agribusiness System and our funders. Thank you, Henry. Uh, judges, any questions? I have a question on your history uh, in terms of uh, what have you done so far? Uh, this project is just starting and because it needs much funding, it hasn't started real work on ground. Have I answered the question? Yes. Uh, so basically, you are at ideation uh, stage. So, kind of. Yeah, the competition also is allows three three groups: ideation, growth, and established. So this is also okay. There's a question from Ali of what is a unique selling point or competitive advantage that you have, not just in Uganda, but at East Africa? The competitive advantage we have uh, is that our pro uh, Uganda always produces in surplus. So if we are able to grade the maize 
and we put it on the exchange, we shall be having the numbers to compete on the East African market since it is digitalized and we are selling on digital via the East African exchange. So that becomes a competitive advantage okay. because they have- I think the question means with what is, what is the competitive advantage your business has over a similar business in case somebody were to start it? Uh, in East Africa, in Uganda, where? In Uganda. Uh, in Uganda, no one has started this a business of the kind. And the advantage we have, we have already the numbers of people who are growing the maize, though they are not organized. On our team, uh, being aided by engineer Bill Wandera, he has the advantage, he has the experience of over 30 years. And I bet with that experience, is able to compete and uh, is, has an advantage over the rest on the market. Uh, judges, any other questions? Or from the other participants? Okay. We don't seem to have any other questions. So we are going to go into a, a short session where judges, where we shall discuss. I'm going to put all the part, all the all the entrepreneurs in the waiting room, and then we shall admit you later. So you have to stay online. Please stay online for everybody. With the judges, please stay online. We're going, I'm going to put everybody in the waiting room, and we can discuss shortly, five minutes maybe, and then do the judging, and bring everybody back. Judges, please let me know when you're finished judging. platform seems to be slow. Henry, there is a question. Henry, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, there is a question. Is that how do you plan to convince farmers to wait for payment? We have what we call a bridging finance. And the way we convince farmers, there are two options. 
on delivery, a farmer can choose to get on spot cash, which is the rolling price at the time in the market then, or he can apply for a bridging finance, of which uh, that funding we connect to the we connect the farmer shall be working with the microfinance, and that microfinance uh, aids farmers to get that money, which will help them wait as they wait for the price to go up. Did they answer your question? Uh, yes, it was a question from Ezra. So as we wait for the, as we wait for the, for the videos to start, for the judges to finish their judging. As we wait for the judges to finish their judging, please note that out of the six that have been chosen, two are going to go on from to the next stage where you'll compete with uh, 300 other people from around the world. You will go through what we call the accelerate stage where you'll get uh, mentors assigned to you from around the world coaches. They, the online platform has a number of resources that you'll be able to use and they'll monitor your progress. So people who have the best progress, your features will be refined, your presentation will be refined, your business will be refined. And then with, of the two done with the best progress, we're going to compete for the 500,000 worldwide. That does not mean that the other person does not get anything. Because as soon as you go to the next stage, you have access to resources online that will help you grow your business. You'll have mentors, you'll have uh, information and access to networks to, com to be able to reach out to other people around the world. This competition is happening in 190, 190 no, about 180 countries. So you'll be able to access those people. For there are people who haven't gotten Where people who haven't uh, gotten through, you can still access this, these resources online. Uh, so we're just having judging happening right now. And we shall see how we can go through with that. Uh, any questions from the members? stream seems to be offline.
sorry for the delay. The system is a bit slow, but the judge is in judging is in progress. We hope to be done within five minutes, and we shall have the final results. For the judges that have finished, okay. The judges that have finished, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, the ventures you work, where you, what you do. Uh, Kevin. Um, I'm Kevin Asinde. I am the MD of a marine financial group. We basically focus on uh, bookkeeping for SMEs. And uh, so we, we offer the bookkeeping services, tax consultancy, and we do a lot of capacity building when it comes to enterprise development. And then we have uh, an online solution that is focused on uh, documents. <laughs> Uh, those are the core areas that we work in. Additionally, I work uh, facilitating uh, building of the Ugandan entrepreneurial ecosystem. So that is a project that I work with together with Swiss Contact and uh, Gideas and then Credit Suisse 
basically trying to uh, identify ways in which we can uh, improve uh, collaboration among among ecosystem actors. So th that's basically me, me in brief. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Uh, anybody else who's done? Ali, Leo, Alan. Yep, I'm done. Okay, Ali, maybe you can you can put a video and tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ali Taha. I'm a financial literacy expert. Um, though of recent I've been specializing in designing games, particularly for financial literacy and also more games catered more to people that are not in urban areas. So I'm talking about out of urban areas. Um, I'm also a farmer, I'm a lecturer, and it has been a pleasure to do this. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Leo Hengis. I work for United Social Ventures. We provide advisory services to early stage startups here in Uganda. Um, so we have regular workshops or at the moment webinars that go on for our members, um, as well as offering one-to-one -one, um, coaching and consultancy on different projects. Over the last couple of years, uh, we've helped ventures raise around um, half a million dollars of financing. Um, so you're welcome to get in touch if you want help. One of the things that we help with um, is um, actually developing the pitch decks of ventures. And I think that's an area where a lot of um, the, the applicants today uh, could benefit from. So you're welcome to get in touch with me or with the organization at united social ventures dot org thank you thank you leo uh the other judge is um is Alan Bryan is having issues with his with his system. Uh, he's still completing his platform judging. Um, Leo, if you had, if you want to share anything on the screen, you can just share it a little bit. Maybe the your your banner, since this is live. or something like that. Um, I'm not sure how to do that off the phone. Oh, yeah, using the phone. Okay, cool. Uh, I think you're just waiting for Alan to finalize. Alan, please let us know when you do finalize. Okay, though the results seem to be currently more. Okay, there's one that could change. Let me just wait for Alan to finalize before we 
announce the results. So you can, whoever doesn't, you can still You can still access this system. There are a lot of other national finals going on. Uh, hold on. So the events, if you go to the EWC website, Entrepreneurship World Cup website, the events are everywhere. Uh, you see St. Lucia is coming up. There are some of the United States, there's Tajikistan. You can all look at these. Uh, EWC Uganda was uh, hosted by Enterprise Uganda, which is a, a quasi-government organization that works with entrepreneurs. It has been in existence since uh, the year 2000 and has reached millions of entrepreneurs countrywide. Uh, for anybody who has any, who requires any help, can always walk in, offices at Lumba Venue, can also look out at the website enterpriseuganda.co.ug. The other national host was Geoka Africa. Geoka Africa has, is an online mentoring platform that is active all over Africa, has a lot of mentoring and business experts that can assist you to grow your business. The third one is Innovent Consults, which does financial literacy training in the form of games and is also online. So in case you have any need for financial literacy trainings or groups, you can always reach out to any of them. But I'm running out of Bulango because we are now on this one. So participants, how was your experience with the uh, EWC so far? Henry? Yes. Christian. Yes, please. Uh, what so far is your experience with the Entrepreneurship World Cup? Um, given the detention, it's still high. <laughs> 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 But I would say it, it's always a good opportunity for us to showcase what we are doing out there to impact communities in the different avenues. And one of the things we always pride ourselves in is being able to leverage these platforms to find partners. Because again, we can't do it alone and we can synergize on the many solutions and uh, uh, strategies out there that can help us and most of these competitions actually shine a light on th these solutions so you, you're struggling with something and you don't know how to solve it and there is someone out there who has the right fit for you and it's through these competitions that we're able to see them all right uh, a blessing have you been as part of such competitions before? Not really. 
I've not I've not done a pitching a pitching competition before. Mm. It's my first time. It's an interesting experience. I have learned quite a number of things. Yes, mm. and I'm, I I was really excited to be part of it. That's what I can say. It's a learning experience. It comes with so many issues that are raised that you need to work on to make uh, your organization or company better and also do a few things that are required internationally. So I am very proud to be part of it. Okay. All right. Uh, the audience results are in. Unfortunately, this year we did not, uh, we hadn't yet considered an, audi an audience prize. Let me see if I can share my screen. These are audience results, how they have been scored. It seems, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, so uh, people have been on the audience and this has been the, the results, people are voting. Chap Chap seems to be the most popular, followed by Yuda with a rating of 4.9, and Moby Clinic, Uganda. Those were quite close neck to neck. Then we have uh, Strategic Resource Management and Coinworth Uganda and Tree Resources Enterprises. I mean, Chap Chap, if there's an audience award, you'd have won it. But congratulations, you seem to have communicated it <laughs> to your Thank business. You. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so one thing I should tell the people is that people always look at, when you're doing your pitch, you should always look at the value proposition of how, how are people going to benefit from your solution and also how you're going to sustain yourself. And in case you get out of questions, like for example, Coinworth, you had out of questions about what sort of venture you are, that means you are not clear in communicating the legal structure or the format that you have for your business. All right, let me check if the judge results are done. Yes, we shall be having those within one minute. Then I'll also share my screen. Okay, so the judging has been completed. I'm going to share my screen. This is an automated system, so everything is, when the judges work on it, it goes to the system immediately. Please note the top two are the ones that are going to go through to the next level, and you will get, you will get a, instructions. So I hope the tension is ending. You can see my screen. Congratulations to Chap Chap and Moby Clinic. You'll be going on to represent Uganda to the next level of the Entrepreneurship World Cup. The rest of you, please, Obugalo for them. I don't hear anybody clapping. But thank you very much. So the grading was out of 20, of 20, of 20. Chap Chap was at 15.7, followed by Moby Clinic at 13.0, and three resources at 12.0, at 12.5. So Chap Chap Africa and Moby Clinic will go on to represent Uganda at our next stage of the Entrepreneurship World Cup. Thank you very much. And thank you all the participants. Okay. So we shall be getting in touch with Chap Chap, Africa and Moby Clinic Uganda to provide with um, provide you the next details of how to go forward. Uh, for the other four ventures, uh, we shall we shall provide you with a free mentoring a free mentoring session. You can send an email uh, to me and organize in the next one month and we shall give you feedback 
and also just do a bit of mentoring for you. You can also access the other resources online. Okay. Thank you very much, judges, and thank you, participants. Uh, congratulations, Chap Chap and Moby Clinic. I hope you do us proud and bring bring back that five hundred thousand US dollars back to Uganda. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cool. Bye bye. Thank you very much for attending today. Thank you. And wish the rest of you the best in your businesses. And also for the other four, please note that your businesses are in the system and you are still in the running for some of the other prizes. For example, if you're a startup, if you're a startup with a social enterprise or at a growth stage, you're also still in the running for a special format prize. So in, you may be able to still win something. All right. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. And congratulations to Chap and Wobby Clinic. All right, you can leave at will.